sister died. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. My name is Mark, and I'm one of the pastors here at St. Joe United Methodist Church. And for those of you who are in the sanctuary this morning, I want to welcome you as we come into this time of fellowship, worship, and praise. For those of you who are joining us online, I want to welcome you as well. We're glad you're here. We pray that this service today will make a difference in your life and that you will know whether you're at home, on the road, uh, at work, or in a hotel room, that you are a part of our life and that God loves you. This morning, a couple of announcements, announcements as we come here this morning. One is welcome. If you're new to St. Joe, we hope you'll come back and join us again. I always tell people when they tell me I'm here for the first time, well, don't let me scare you away. And uh, if you've ever been in a church for the first time, it's a little overwhelming to figure out names and faces and traditions and rooms. But if you're new, we're thrilled you're here. Make sure this morning that you fill out the connection card, and we do use that. We do pay attention to that. And if you have prayer concerns or celebrations, we pay attention to that as well. If you're like me, you've watched the pictures from Florida with shock. Uh, we live in a world of need, whether it's Ukraine or it's parts of California. But uh, my family, our family, has gone down to, to Fort Myers for 35 years. And uh, Sanibel and Captiva is a special place for our family. So we look at those pictures and wonder how to respond. You've already been doing that with your prayers, I know. You may have made a gift already online. I want to let you know a, a wonderful thing about being United Methodist is that we are connected around the world. So, for example, your pastor, I grew up in a little village in northwest Alaska, and my father was the only physician of the single physician hospital that was accredited in the United States. And that medical care happened on the Bering Peninsula, the Seward Peninsula, because of United Methodists. So, we have something called United Methodist Committee on Relief. It is already at work, beginning to work in Florida, just as it was in Louisiana, just as it did in Puerto Rico. So I want you to know that you can go online to the United Methodist Committee on Relief, and you can make a, a gift uh, online if you'd like to do that, or you can make a check out to St. Joe United Methodist Church. Down in the corner, you can put Florida or UMCOR. And what we will do is every penny that you give goes to the work on the ground. Not one penny is kept for denominational cost. Not one penny would be kept at St. Joe. So if you give $100 or $500 to relief for Florida and you make that to UMCOR, every penny goes to that. It's one of the best ways you can give. So um, you're not helpless uh, because we're in Indiana. We can still respond. And I know some of our first impulses are to run to where the problem is. And I can remember years ago, I don't know which end of a hammer to use, and I can remember some, there had been a disaster and somebody from that area said, the best thing you can do for us is stay in Indiana. And so, but pray and give. Also, at St. Joe, we're in the process of addressing a flat roof problem. And so last Sunday, we announced, you've received the letter, we're trying to raise, we'd love to raise 200,000. We'd love to raise that. But some of you have already responded, and I've said to you, if you want to talk with me about a major gift, I would love to do that. So uh, at least one of you has already called me and talked to me about making a major gift to this project. But we look forward to hearing from you. You'll find letters and pledge cards around the building. You can place your pledge card to a shelter from the storm the roof project, you can just put that in the offering boxes outside the door or mail that to the church office. 
There is a card, a big card, for Mike Walter. And Mike is back there in the corner, and he has been a key part of our ministry team now for a while. And yes. So there is a really, really big card out there, and you can sign that after the service this morning, and there are some refreshments out there as well. So we'd invite you after worship to linger and, uh, and to say thank you to him and enjoy some fellowship. The last thing I would say this morning as we begin is this is World Communion Sunday. So if you're at home this morning and you're worshiping with us online, I want you to go ahead and get ready to celebrate communion. You can get a piece of bread and grape juice or lemonade or a cracker, uh, whatever that is, and you can join us as we celebrate communion later in the service. One of the things that I love about being United Methodist is that our table is open. You don't have to be a member. You don't have to be 12 years old. Um, it's open. And we come not really because we're qualified. We come because we need grace. So today, we celebrate World Communion Sunday, and before you and I ever got up, there were Christians gathering in Botswana and South Africa and the Congo and Kenya, and they've already been celebrating World Communion Sunday while you and I slept and as we came to church. And so we get a chance at a time of division in the world to remember and act out the unity that God wants for us. So, I'm so glad to be here with you this morning. Here we come uh, to worship God, to offer our praise and our thanksgiving. I don't know what the morning has been like. On my way to church this morning, there were some people, and the way they drove made me think, you need to go to church. <laughs> uh, because the text talks about self-control and love. So I don't know if it's been an easy morning or a tough morning, an easy week or a tough week, but as we gather, I would invite you to breathe this morning. The Lord be with you. And also with you. It's so good to be together.
Good morning. Good morning. Please stand as you are able and join me in our call to worship. Tears, we mistakenly think, are a sign of failure or a lack of faith. We even try to hide them when we are in worship. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 137 how he sat alongside Babylon's streams and struggled to sing songs of praise. People of faith know what it is to cry. People of faith go through times of sadness and exile. Nothing seems to be the way it should be. When our heart is broken, we can turn away from God or turn towards God. If your heart is breaking and you find it hard to sing, welcome to a place where it is as safe to be sad as it is to be joyful. When the tears come because of joy or sadness, we lift up our hands in this sanctuary and praise the Lord. Let us continue to worship together by singing our opening hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Join me as we affirm our faith through the affirmation from 1 Corinthians and Colossians. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and appeared first to the women, then to Peter and the twelve, and then on many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the Anointed One of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross reconciles all things to God. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. We praise you, God, for your creative genius, your passion for justice, your artistry in healing and peacemaking, and the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We live in a world where there are places of deep darkness, we are always tempted to surrender to the darkness. 
It is easy to let fear control us, hate control us, shame control us, greed control us, and addiction to drugs or power or pornography control us. It is easy to give in to the impulse to judge others while ignoring our own sin and brokenness. But the darkness does not have the last word, Lord. You have the last word. Your love has the last word. Your truth has the last word. Your resurrection power that can make all things new has the last word. In these moments of worship, steer us back to the reality that the darkness cannot put out the light of your love and truth, Jesus. The beauty of your life, the power of your liberating truth, and the saving force of your love draws to you and away from the darkness that would have us. We pray for those who suffer because of war and violence. We pray for those who suffer the most because they have the least. We pray for those in Florida, Cuba, Nova Scotia, and other places where, who, whose lives have been turned upside down by storms. And we lift up those, go through, uh, uh, those going through a time of spiritual boredom, indifference, and lifelessness. Surround us with your peace, presence, and power. Fill your church with your loving power and send us out to be helpers, whether the need is down the street or around the world. Receive our prayers this morning as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. The scripture reading uh, today comes from two places, and uh, I've got to tell you that I, I had a different sermon that I thought I was going to be preaching, and uh, early in the week I began to look at the text, and I thought, it's not doing anything for me. <laughs> and so I thought if it wasn't doing anything for me, it might not do anything for you. And so I ended up in the lectionary, which is a series of readings that is used often in Presbyterian, Catholic, Orthodox, Lutheran, and Methodist churches. And so the first reading today is from uh, Luke 17, just a couple of opening verses. Even if someone sins against you seven times in one day and returns to you seven times and says, I'm changing my ways, you must forgive that person. Did you hear that? Sometimes Jesus says things I don't agree with and I don't like. If someone sins against you seven times in one day, and returns to you seven times and says, I'm changing my ways, you must forgive that person. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith, right? The apostles are thinking, come on, Jesus. The Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. In other words, he's saying, if your faith is strong enough, you'll be able to do what you didn't think you could do, like forgiving the person you don't want to forgive. Would any of you say to your servant who had just come in from the field after plowing or tending sheep, come sit down for dinner? Wouldn't you say instead, fix my dinner, put on the clothes of a table servant, and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you can eat and drink. You won't thank the servant because the servant did what you asked, will you? In the same way, when you have done everything required of you, you should say, 
We servants deserve no special praise. We have only done our duty. So what he's saying is when you and I give and when you and I forgive and when you and I uh, speak up for justice, you know, I shouldn't look in the mirror and expect a big reward because I'm just doing what I was made to do. Now the epistle reading or the, the reading from the letters of Paul comes from the little letter of 2 Timothy and this is what caught me. <clears throat> and Paul who is in prison in Rome and his life is about to end. He knows that the end is near. He's writing to a young man who was a partner in ministry and uh, they've been separated for a while. And listen to what Paul says to this young Christian. From Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will. In other words, he's saying, you know, I didn't really choose this, but God chose me to promote the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. I love that phrase, to promote the promise of the life that's in Christ Jesus. In John 10, 10, we're told Jesus came to bring us life and life abundant. To Timothy, my dear child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And then he says this, I'm grateful to God whom I serve with a good conscience as my ancestors did, as my Jewish ancestors did. I constantly remember you in my prayers day and night. The old man in prison says, every day and every night, I think of you. When I remember your tears, I long to see you so that I can be filled with happiness. I'm reminded of your authentic faith. Listen to that. Authentic faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. So you might stop and think about the people in your life who you saw deep faith in. Maybe a mom, a dad, an uncle, a youth worker, a coach, a grandma, a grandpa, somebody who you watched and you could tell the depth and power of their faith. I'm sure that this faith is also inside you. It's still in there, Timothy. Because of this, I'm reminding you to revive God's gift that is in you through the laying on of my hands. God didn't give us a spirit that's timid, but one that is powerful, loving, and self-controlled. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
I'm so blessed. We're so blessed by this gift of music. So, can I walk around, Mike? Do I get in trouble if I do this? Okay. I, I won't scare you too much, but I've been in the habit of walking down the aisle, and uh, so I don't want to make life too difficult. When I was just uh, young, yesterday, you know how that is. <laughs> I had finished my first year at Duke Divinity School, and I realized I was the father of a, of a one-year-old. I was married, and, and I needed, uh, I did not want to go into debt. And so I met the district superintendent from the Burlington District. I had indicated to the cabinet that I would accept a student appointment. So one quiet evening, Dr. Nicholas W. Grant district superintendent of the Burlington District met with me in the hallway of the Divinity School. We sat there. We began to talk. He listened to me. I listened to him. And after a while, he said in a very thick North Carolina accent, Mark, I think I have a church for you. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Grant was uh, very old. He was 62, I think, maybe <laughs> 65. And colleagues of mine had told me uh, when I was appointed to a church in the Burlington District, they said, watch out for Nick Grant because he's grumpy and critical and impossible to please. He ran for bishop, didn't get it, and he's never been happy since. <laughs> and having run for bishop and not made it myself, you know, I, I hope that doesn't fit me, but anyway, I was very cautious around Dr. Grant, who had a thatch of silver hair, very red face, always wore a dark navy blue suit with a dark tie and a starched white shirt. I discovered something about Nick W. Grant. I discovered he was a good man. And I discovered he wasn't grumpy and he wasn't critical. But this is what I did discover, and I think it outraged some of my colleagues. He thought that what we did mattered. How we preached and how we led worship and how we loved people mattered. And I told people, you know what I've discovered, discovered about Dr. Grant? He expects his preachers to work. <laughs> I remember one night after the, our little brick church building was back in the woods and standing out in a gravel parking lot talking to Dr. Grant, the 62, 65-year-old man with this 24-year-old Yankee. And I realized that our conversation had become a conversation between colleagues of different generations, but he was sharing his heart with me and I was talking to him. I remember when I needed to talk to Dr. Grant or I needed to turn in a report, he would say to me, come to the Burlington office and let's sit and talk. And then he wanted me to stay in North Carolina, which was sweet. And then he figured if he couldn't keep me in North Carolina, he would let me know I shouldn't take a full load. If I didn't take a full load of classes, I'd be one class short, I'd have to come back for a third year. <laughs> And when I moved from Bloomington back north of the Mason-Dixon line, as I was going through things, I was surprised to find some, picture, uh, some letters from Dr. Grant to me. I had not remembered that we had stayed in touch, but after I moved back from the land of ACC basketball, okra, right, and tobacco, we moved back to the land of breaded tenderloins, euchre, and Big Ten basketball. Apparently, I had continued a conversation with Dr. Grant, a correspondence with Dr. Grant, and when he had retired and then Ruth had some physical problems, I continued to write to them and would call periodically and ask how they were, and he would ask how I was doing, and our family was growing. And there was great tenderness in those letters. I'd forgotten that. 
And in one of his letters, he told me what it had meant to him to have me as a pastor, um, as a friend, and a young man listening to him. And I told him what it had meant to me to have a mentor. And then he said that he would always be thankful, and he asked me not to forget him. So Paul is in prison. He's in prison in Rome, probably under house arrest, so people could come and visit him. And he writes to young Timothy. And you heard the affection, right, in the letter as he writes? And he says this to Timothy. He says, you know, he says, I remember the authentic faith that was in you. I remember how much in love with God you were. I can remember how hope had you. It may have come from your grandma or it may have come from your mom, but boy, do you remember, he says, do you remember when I laid hands on you? Remember how I prayed over you and, and then I like to fill in the blanks with my own kind of picture. Remember how I prayed over you and you stood up and you were in tears and I was in tears because of this moment and I hugged you and then the, our small group gathered around you. We said we'd pray for you as God used you in the years ahead in ways we couldn't imagine and then how we all went out to IHOP and had ice cream till two in the morning. Do you remember how, th do you remember how your heart was on fire for God? I remember your authentic faith. There's authentic faith, there's inauthentic faith, and you know it. Maybe you're struggling with that this morning. It's easy to wear a cross. It's easy to carry a Bible. It's easy to go to church. It's easy to send our kids to Christian schools. It's easy to put the decal of a cross on the back of our truck. But to let God have us is something else. Authentic faith, real faith. I used to take the staff at Elkhart Trinity out to lunch once a month, and believe it or not, I know we're addressing a serious long-term budget issue here at, at St. Joe, but we're gonna start taking the staff out once a month for lunch. It's gonna be someplace cheap. <laughs> I don't know, can you do that? Can you take people out to an inexpensive place as a way of encouraging them? We're going to see if I can thread that needle. But I have discovered I could take the staff at Elkhart Trinity out to Olive Garden because they had soup, salad, and breadsticks. And that's what I told everybody. I said, if the church is paying for it, you're getting soup, salad, and breadsticks. If you want something nicer than that, it's on your tab. So when they were standing there by the hostess station, you know, and they have that big platter of desserts. You know that? You've seen that, right? And I'm just amazed we're standing there waiting to be seated, and I thought, you know, those things look so lifelike. It's amazing what they can do with rubber. <laughs> and so, I never forget, I took my index finger of my right hand, and I pressed it down on the top a piece of chocolate cheesecake. And I thought, that's amazing how that just kind of goes down like that. That's amazing how the, and then I turned my finger over and it had chocolate all over the tip of my finger. And I looked up at the hostess who was standing three feet away looking at me with a look of, I won't tell you what she, and I looked at her and I just said, I thought it was fake. And she looked at me and she said, well, it's not. <laughs> Authentic faith. Faith that goes down deep. Where our hearts are on fire with love for God. I think it's interesting when I read about the United Methodist Mission, you know, and it's, I'm glad I'm a United Methodist, but we are to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And it sounds like we turn them out like cookies, right? We make disciples like the brand makes chocolate. But the reality is there's a mysterious kind of 
process where people fall in love with God. I remember I was sitting in Bloomington in the backyard uh, last fall near a park, and you need to know, I don't know one bird from another. I can recognize a cardinal and a robin and a osprey, maybe. And a northern flicker on a day like this came down, fluttering down, and landed about eight feet from me. And I almost fell over. I'd never seen a northern flicker before in my whole life. And I wanted to say to the bird, could you just wait a minute and let me go get some people? But that's sometimes how faith comes. You hear a song. You read a story in the Bible. You're in worship. You, you receive bread from the hand of someone who loves you. And you discover that you've fallen in love with God. That's how it happens so often. And Paul says to young Timothy, you know, I remember the authentic faith you had. And it's asleep. It's on life support. It's become this pale, lifeless, forgotten thing in your life. We don't know what's happened, and you and I could probably tell stories all afternoon about moments in life that have been hard for us, that put a dent in our faith or took it away. If you look through the letter of Timothy, it's interesting to listen. Maybe it was adolescent cravings that Paul talks about, the jumping into the, this crazy desire to not only have what we have, but have more, have more, have more, have more. Maybe that's what, maybe that's what stole the life from Timothy's faith, or maybe, maybe it is betrayal. Paul says in his letter, he says, you know, all my friends in Asia have left me. You may have gone through a time of betrayal and you know how that wrecks your heart and if you can't trust, then it's hard to trust God. Psalm 137 is the psalm of lament. We use that as a call to worship today and the psalmist says in Psalm 137, I sat by the streams of Babylon in exile where nothing was right and people asked me to sing the Lord's song. I could not. So I'm just going to hang up my musical instrument. I'm going to hang up my guitar for a while by the willows. So somewhere, Timothy has lost this powerful, life-changing faith. And the old man says this, and this is what caught me. Revive God's gift in you. You see, sometimes we can lose our faith as individuals. We go through a, a time of betrayal. We, go, we discover we chase false gods. Or we just simply read headlines from Ukraine and we just can't stand one more story about a child who doesn't have access to health care or fresh water. But sometimes churches lose their faith. Sometimes churches, congregations lose their faith. And so Paul says, let the Spirit of God breathe his life-giving breath across the embers of your faith and make it a bold, powerful thing again. You know how it is sometimes uh, a couple who were once in love, they have gotten to the point where they find one another just irritating. And, um, and the man one day is looking through things and opens a box and there are, is a collection of pictures from the 1970s or 1980s or 1960s, whenever it was, and there's a picture 
of the man and his wife on one of their first dates. It was to Indiana Beach. And there's one picture of them by the water. And then there's a picture of them working on separate ends of the same elephant ear. And as he looks at the picture, he sees the delight in their eyes for each other. The love there that overwhelmed them, took control of their lives. And he puts the picture down and he begins to go through the house looking for his wife. He f doesn't find her anywhere, but he finds her in the backyard. It's late in the summer, early in the fall. She's going through the garden. She's down on her knees in a pair of torn blue jeans, an old flannel shirt, and a straw hat that he has always thought made her look ridiculous. And he bends down and he puts his arm around her and then he nuzzles her neck. And she turns and she says, what's gotten into you? <laughs> and he can't tell her that he's seen a picture of someone who was in love and he wants that back again. Revive the gift. Revive the gift that is in you. God always shows up. I, I have so many stories of God showing up. I remember one evening, I mean, I could tell story after story. I can remember one night in a driving rainstorm at the end of a day of worship, a day like this, as members of a church I served were unloading a truck and filling a community food pantry. The rain was coming down. I looked around and I thought, John and Charles Wesley, Jesus would smile. This is the way this is supposed to be. I can remember one night in Kenya sitting out in an inner courtyard praying and journaling, shivering beneath my coat. I could smell the fires across this city, which is a terribly poverty-stricken area. I could smell the fires where people were cooking their meals. And then in the middle of this incredible poverty, this, this visitor from Indiana who was there for a work mission, I could hear the Africans be sing, begin singing songs of praise. Their songs of praise hung across the city. And the notes of hope and the notes of joy sort of came over the courtyard, came down and caught me. And even in the last two weeks, God shows up. And I've got to tell you, sometimes when God shows up, I just start laughing. Are you kidding me? So uh, two weeks ago, I decided to join the youth group on Wednesday night. I hadn't intended on joining the youth group on Wednesday night. I just I'd worked a little late, and the kids were getting here. Sarah was here, and, and then I heard they had pizza. And <laughs> so uh, I went out, and I watched the kids play in the parking lot. And I have, was wearing sandals and shorts, and so I didn't do that. Uh, and then they came inside, and I got a piece of pizza and some sap, and I sat with them while they ate and talked. And God began to bless me. And I remembered what it was like when I was first a youth director. I remember what that was like. To not be a lead pastor and not be in charge of big buildings and big campaigns, but listen to the kids who went to South Bend Riley. And then we went over after the meal. I wasn't going to stay because I'm a busy man, you know, I'm very important. And <laughs> I went over, I sat in a circle as the kids began to talk about their day. And then Sarah had them read from the Gospels the story of the call of the disciples. And as they had read those, she, without looking at me, 
without being ironic, said this to the kids, can you imagine starting over at 70? And I thought, I didn't say anything, but I thought, are you kidding me? I'm living it. <laughs> and then inside, I just smiled and I said, God, you have a way of showing up. Last story. There's a young man who's a therapist in Cincinnati, Ohio. He was in our church in Elkhart. He was a wonderful young man. He's now probably in his early to mid-30s. He spent several years of his professional life. What he would do is he would take rich, spoiled kids, either sent there by their parents or sent by the courts, and take them out into the mountains of Utah for a month-long camping expedition. And now he's in uh, Cincinnati, and so he and I have reconnected. And about once every six months, we get on the phone. I've told him some of the struggles I've gone through. He tells me what he's wrestling through. And we had this great conversation on uh, Wednesday. I was in the office by Zoom. And then at the end of the conversation, this young man says this. He says, I want you to know that when I was a teenager, I came into your office to talk to you. He said, you probably don't remember this. I said, no, I don't. He said, I can't remember what you told me, but I've never forgotten how you made me feel. And you listened to me. And I felt heard. I felt loved. And I felt at the same time strangely challenged. And then he said this. He said some other things that I won't tell you, but he said this, I think you will hold on to and remember what I've just said to you. And I leaned back and I nodded and I said, thank you. Do you remember what it was like to have that kind of faith? Do you remember what it was like when St. Joe reached out to the world in a bold and powerful way? Revive the gift. And maybe this morning, as we come to this moment, we can ask God to do that in us. We come to the table this morning, and uh, I know the first challenge of communion is to open this. <laughs> Someone asked, will we ever go back to bread and a chalice? Yes, we will. There are so many amazing things about Jesus. One of the most amazing is that he uses a meal as the sign of God's grace for us. So whether you're eating breakfast or lunch or supper, or it's that midnight thing you do before you go to bed, remember that he said every time you break bread and drink, you remember me. Holy Spirit, come and rest upon these gifts of bread and juice as we gather here for you, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we would be one with him, one with you, and one in service to all the world. Jesus gathered with his disciples in an upper room in Jerusalem, and he said to his friends, this is my body which is given for you. Receive this and remember me. And after supper, as he looked around the room and he saw them all, he didn't hold back 
from Judas or Simon, Pe Simon Peter, but he said to all of them, and this is my blood which was shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Will you pray with me? E Eternal and loving God, find us again. Holy Spirit, revive the gift that is in us and set our hearts on fire with love for you and let this pale, lifeless, forgotten thing become a great and powerful and good and beautiful thing. We pray this in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Creator, Sustainer, Redeemer of all things. Revive us. Bring us to life again. Resurrect us, we pray, in the name of the Christ. Amen. As you leave, remember to sign the card for Mike. And uh, if you see him, give him a big St. Joe hug. And uh, so remember that. United Methodist Committee on Relief, before you go to bed tonight, do something to help the folks in Florida. Any size gift will make a difference. And continue to pray and then respond to our invitation to help take care of a flat roof so we can get ready for the party that's about to start at St. Joe. I am so blessed to be with you. And there is such life here. 
So go from this place in the name of Jesus Christ. Go in peace, go in faith, go in joy. Amen.